For years, there's been complicated ties between the Cubans in Cuba and the ones in the United States. But that's now changing. These shores are getting closer. Today, we will meet Hugo Cancio, a Cuban-American entrepreneur and also the owner of On Cuba, a magazine and a project that tries to create a bridge between the two countries. So, On Cuba, uh, in which the main uh, house we are in right now, is pioneering Hugo, because this idea of a media which is not hostile to Cuba or United States, and it's like a bridge between the two countries and the two communities. It seems like a big dream. Why did you uh, came up with, with this idea? Well, it's, hostility comes from, from hard feelings. Um, I don't have any hard feeling towards my native country. I love Cuba. This is, I have an unconditional love for, my, you know, for, for this country. And, and I'm also grateful that my mother took the opportunity to take me to the United States when I was a child. So I love both countries. So the project comes out of love, affection, the need to build bridges of understanding and reconciliation between my community where I live today and the city where I was born, Havana. And, and that's where on Cuba it's born. It's born out of, out of um, the idea that we needed to educate Americans that Cuba is more than what American newscast media portrayed it is. It's not a country, a militarized country. It's not a country that is constantly involved in political and ideological differences and discord. It's a country that, that houses over 11.5 million people that are, deserve a better future. So in one way or another, uh, are involved in, in some political differences, a struggle to normalize relationships, just to establish a, uh, a, normal, a normal dialogue conversation. So what Cuba offers is, is an opportunity to build bridges of understanding, to change minds and hearts of people, and to educate people that Cuba is a wonderful country. Uh, we don't shy away from you know, certain type of criticism, um, we don't shy away from doing uh, real journalism, but at the same time, we don't want to be portrayed as the national Cuban media or my local El Nuevo Herald or the Miami Herald in the United States. We found, uh, we found a space in the middle to where we don't have to pick sizes. You know, we don't have to pick, um, you know, I'm defending this way of looking at things or I'm defending this other way. We're not defending anything. We're just showcasing. And you've been successful. And I, I have a question, Hugo. Um, we've seen uh, during 55 years of evolution how some uh, Cubans uh, that live in the United States have tried to do the same thing that you've done, uh, develop a, a media with a different discourse than the main media or the mainstream from the United States. And they've received attacks, even, <laughs> even terrorist attacks like Alianza Martiana and, and some other organizations that have developed some kind of media. I know that your uh, line, your editorial line is not the same, exactly the same, but has common points with them. How come this has not happened within, within Cuba? It looks like you've done this smoothly. Why? Why you could do it and why they couldn't do it? Well, I've lived in Miami for 35 years. I know my community. I have promoted and produced Cuban music in the United States for over 30 years. So I'm accustomed to threats and death threats and bombs and, and being under, you know, protection from government agencies and so forth and so on with threats to my life and my family. Um, on Cuba offers a Cuba, uh, an in information and news um, from Cuba that it's pertaining belongs to every single Cuba. Cuban. So how can you criticize something that is our heritage, is our culture, belongs to all of us regardless of our political differences? So that's what we're trying to focus and perhaps that has been the key to where it has prevented us from getting into the same type of issues that you just mentioned earlier. And I would add the fact that there's been 
things are changing <laughs> in the United States and in Cuba. And, and in Cuba. And in things, so that makes things easier for well, you? Well, let's put it this way. I guess we started this project with the right foot and the perfect timing. Timing is very important. Timing is extremely important. <laughs> yeah, let's go and know more of uh, in Cuba. I'll, I'll, I'd like to show you more. So, Hugo, I would like to know a little bit more about how come, and I think that's something our audience would be interested in, how come you've developed this media in Cuba with Cuban journalists working, because that's uh, another thing in which on Cuba is different, because is uh, a lot of Cuban Americans read it, but it's written here in, in, in Cuba by Cubans. I imagine you've had obstacles. Did you have it from United States or from Cuba or from both sides? Oh, well, obstacle is, it's, obstacles are always there when you're doing something challenging, when you're doing something uh, that is considered to be a pioneer project. Uh, so uh, obstacles is something that we have to deal with on a daily basis, but those are obstacles that we are able to overcome because in my personal opinion there's a willingness there's a desire to know more about Cuba there's a desire to know exactly what's going on out, outside of the you know regular normal already established new news media outlets in the United States are why do you think that's happening that need or, or, or lacking of Cubans information what, what do you think what do you think is that happening well, I, I, I think the, the political climate is changing, it has changed. I, you know, I think there's, there's a newer generation that is pushing for changes. There's many years ago, we had a family tie, an emotional tie to our country of origin. But today, uh, this newer generation not only has the family and cultural and emotional tie to their country of origin, they have an economic tide. You know, I see when I walk the streets of Havana or anywhere in Cuba, I see new businesses flourishing everywhere. Um, it, it, is, it is my opinion that potentially up to 90%, maybe even more, who knows, of those businesses is being financed from family members living abroad, especially in Miami in the United States. So now there's over and above the family, cultural and emotional tie, there's a financial tie to your country. We in Miami had to change the mind and hearts of the people and, real, and elect new politicians that will represent the majority of Miami Cubans. But, but That's not what's happening now. Well, Do you, know, you think the people that are in the Congress represents what Cuban Americans want in, in Florida? They, they represent a small portion. Uh, the, the demographics are now, you know, uh, are, are totally different and they are aware of that. Do you think there's a majority of Cuban Americans in Florida that want uh, a change towards oh, the polls? Oh, yeah, the, the, the polls. It's a majority. The polls suggest it. The polls are there. The numbers are there. You know, um, you know, the majority of Cuban Americans, the majority of South Floridians now are um, are desiring, you know, uh, the normalization of the relationship between Cuba and the United States for economic reasons, for whatever reason. But there's now uh, a genuine change in my community to where you know, they believe it is time to leave the embargo, for instance. You know, it's an obsolete measure that hasn't taken us nowhere. And, and they are basically in favor of this current administration, which has all the opportunities in the world in the next coming years. The final years of the Obama administration, I believe the president has every chance in the world, every opportunity to to bring about you know change in U.S. Cuba policy, I think I think he's mentioned it. Or I, I remember he mentioned it. I, I kind of get the feeling that he wants it as part of his legacy, and I believe that in his heart he knows it's the right thing to do. What do you think it takes in the United States political environment to make a stronger? pressure towards uh, Washington DC to change things? Awareness, um, little people uh, doing little things, uh, um, projects like on Cuba, projects like the culture, current cultural exchange. Do you think media is essential? To media, media, media is essential, uh, media is essential. Uh, projects such as 
um, you know, the people-to-people -people travel of American citizens. Cuba, uh, for the U.S. government, is the neighbor of the South. I mean, we're, we're right here. Um, normalizing relationship will bring about you know, a tremendous amount of economic benefits to the U.S. economy, especially to South Florida. So as Cuba continues to open up, as Cuba continues to bring about change and reforms, economic reforms, uh, emigration reforms, and so forth and so on, the world is noticing. The United States are noticing, the U.S. citizens are noticing, and we're saying, hey, we want to be a part of this. You've uh, mentioned several times uh, the fact that so many Cubans went, went to the United States uh, pursuing the American dream. But you want to fly to Havana and park your helicopter in the top of your building. Cuban Americans think that who better than them to invest in Cuba? There are people coming back. There are people that want to live in the two countries. There are big businessmen like Alfie Van Hul that wants to come back here too. Do you think that American dream that used to be pursued is changing? Is, is not anymore American? It's a different dream? But it depends what the, what the definition of an American dream is. Uh, my definition is having, three, having lived a, uh, a wonderful experience in my lifetime, um, made my mother proud. The dream that I'd like to fulfill right now is seeing U.S. Cuba policy change and seeing the normal, in my lifetime, which I'm, which I'm still young and healthy, um, seeing the normalization of the relationship between both countries and seeing 11.5 something million people move forward and prosper and be happy and be able to travel and enjoy some of the things that any human being deserves to enjoy. And if I could contribute to that by building, putting bricks on a malecon with my own hands or by establishing businesses or by making people aware of what Cuba is all about through our magazines, okay, I'll be able to move into the next world an extremely happy, happy, happy soul. I like to believe that some of those Cubans that you mentioned, they have already fulfilled their American dreams as well. And now they have a legitimate desire to, to bring those, to mean that dream, to, to, to offer some of what they were able to achieve, contributed to their native country. Uh, I have got to believe those are their motivations. And if that's what it is, I think they should all be allowed to come back and, and, and participate. And I think that if, I, if you and I were to close our eyes right now and, and, and open the, our eyes five, ten years from now, God knows what Cuba will be then. So that's the Cuba I'm looking forward, and I, uh, to, forward to see. And I think those changes are taking place today and it makes me happy. Thank you very much, Hugo. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you.